initiated by Takshila Educational Society to further ideas that foster learning, self-expression, and ingenuity. In order to facilitate better understanding of our world and its concerns, we bring articulate speakers from all walks of life on this platform to propagate diverse themes, thoughts, and perspectives. In today's sessions titled Game of Forces and Into Magnetism, our presenter, Deshanki Soni from Tinkerly, facilitates practical understanding of science concepts through hands-on experiments. These constitute the fourth session of Saturday webinars, a sub-series of virtual sessions under Beyond Boundaries on career-oriented knowledge and skills. Deshanki Soni is an associate product developer at Tinkerly, who specializes in creating cool science DIY kits. A graduate from the National Institute of Technology, Jalandhar, she has been investing her passion for experimenting into making science fun for school level learners. Tinkerly is an initiative of young, talented science enthusiasts and engineers, which deploy its expertise in STEM education by setting tinkering labs, developing wide range of science kits, and providing hands-on tutorials offline and online to propagate neoteric thinking. The speaker would present the first topic, Game of Forces, for the first 30 minutes and answer viewers' questions on it for the next 15 minutes. Thereafter, she would present the second topic, Into Magnetism, also for 30 minutes, followed by answering viewers' questions in the last 15 minutes of the session. You may submit questions through the chat box of our YouTube channel. So we begin. Over to our speaker, Deshanki Soni. Thanks, Rupa, ma'am, for this great introduction. And uh, before I start the session, I would like to uh, thank the Akshila group for uh, this great opportunity. So uh, I'll be presenting you the session. So I hope that all you can see my screen and uh, it's great to be here and I'm very excited for this session. And uh, uh, in the support section, if you have any doubt during the session, you can ask, you can shoot in the comment section and I have a support team. I have Utkarsh and Himanshu there and they will solve your doubts, right? So uh, before, uh, without any further ado, let's just get started. So as you can see on your screen, uh, his Newton, like with the apple. His name is Sir Isaac Newton, and he he was a great scientist. And uh, we we all know him uh, because he discovered the gravity. But he has uh, many other contributions of him of his in uh, mathematics and in other branches of physics. Okay, so in this particular section, uh, in this particular session, uh, we are gonna learn about the Newtons. Uh, laws of motions. Okay, so uh, so let's get started with this one. Okay, so do uh, so you see that the motion motion happening around the screen, like the ball is moving, the airplane is moving, the toy airplane, obviously, and the boy uh, uh, he's uh, he's catching a ball, and the wheel is also moving. So why these are things are in motion? So it's my question. So I'm constantly looking at my chat section and uh, whenever you will answer, uh, I'll, I'll I can read from the chat, from your comments, okay? So uh, what is the reason why uh, behind this motion? Why things move in a particular way? <clears throat> so you all can answer me in the comment section and I'm looking at it. So if you have any answers, you can just uh, tell me in the comment section, okay? So the reason behind this motion is nothing but force. And what is force? Force is, force can be described as push or pull. Suppose I want to open a door 
I need to apply a force on it. Either I need, uh, either I need to pull the door or I need to pull the door. Okay, in both the cases, I need to apply a force on the door. Okay, so so that is the force, and this can be described as push or pull. Okay, so uh, as you can see, that there are two blocks on the screen: block A and block B. Okay. <clears throat> And block A, I'm applying a force in one direction. And in block B, I'm applying a force in both the direction, like this, okay? So which block will move first? Block A will move or the block B will move, okay? So what are your answers? Which block will move? The block A or block B? What do you think is going to happen, right? So <clears throat> block A, is going to move and as you can uh, see on your screen and uh, in block B I'm applying force from both the direction and those forces will cancel out each other and that's the reason why block B is going to move is is going to stay where it was before right but in block A I'm applying force in one direction and that's the reason why block A is going to move right so uh, these are also uh, known as the unbalanced and balanced forces. On block B, both the forces are balanced. And on block A, uh, the force is unbalanced. There is no other force that will oppose the force that I'm applying to block A. And that's the reason it will move. OK? So whenever there is a motion, there is always going to be a force, right? So uh, let's talk about these unbalanced and balanced forces a little bit more. And I'll show you an activity that you can also perform at home. So I have two folks right there. And uh, from this activity, you will also understand a term that is a center of mass. OK, so let me play this activity and I'll show you what I did here. So I have two folks right there. And I'm going to place the coin between these box, okay? Like this, okay? And I am balancing those, the whole system on the tip of that toothpick. And you can also try this at home and you can, also, you can find the forks and toothpick from your kitchen, okay? So this is how uh, you can also uh, balance it on your fingertip like this. So it's all about the balancing because all the forces on the on, on the system are balanced. There is no motion and it is balanced on the tip of the toothpick. Right. So this is about the balancing of forces. But why it has why is it balancing on that point? Do you know the reason why? Why is it only balancing on that point? If I hold that from the other end of the toothpick, it will not balance, right? So the reason why is it balancing on that point? It's because that the, the point is the center of mass that of that system, okay? And because of that, the center of mass is a point where I can balance the whole mass, right? So for example, when we were a children, we used to balance the scale on our finger like this, okay? And that point where we used to balance the scale is the center of mass, center of mass of that scale. And the center of mass balances the mass of the whole body. So in that activity, the tip of the toothpick was the center of mass, all right? So you can also try this one. But uh, why did it got balanced like this? It's because uh, the whole system was applying a force on my fingertip. And in reaction to that, my fingertip was also applying a force on that system. And because uh, there are forces from both the direction uh, uh, and those opposite forces, they canceled out each other. And all the forces got balanced and that's the reason why it got balanced like that, okay? So uh, these are about the balancing and unbalancing force. Suppose I'm sitting uh, on a chair and uh, I'm applying a force on the ground that is equal to my weight. So uh, 
as a result the ground is also applying a force on me and both the forces they cancel out each other and i can sit very stably on this chair because there are no bad no unbalanced forces okay so these are all about the balance and unbalanced forces so i will dig deeper into the forces and before uh, i go ahead uh, you need to uh, know about uh, all the forces or the forces that we have seen are the contact forces okay when if if i am applying some force on the wall i need to touch the wall if i want to bring my book from the almira i need to go there and put my and pick my book right but uh, i'm not a superhuman being that uh, i can just watch the book and the book will come to me directly i need to go there i need to pick the book and only then i can have it right so but some there are some forces which are non contact forces and uh, for example gravity is non contact forces and can you uh, can you tell any other force which is non contact force if you know the answer you can just type in the comment section and i am constantly looking at the comment section and uh, i don't see any answers right there so uh, if you uh, if you know any other force which is non contact force just type in the comment section okay okay so uh, all the uh, fundamental forces which are a uh, gravitational force magnetic force electrostatic force and nuclear force all of these fundamental forces are non contact forces right for example the magnetic force if i have a magnet on in my hand and if i bring that magnet near to a iron nail the iron nail is got is will be in some kind of motion or that will start moving why i i haven't touched the magnet to it but before i'm touching the magnet it already starts moving right so the reason behind that is that the magnet magnetic force is non contact force you do not have to make contact between two objects to apply magnetic force on it okay so magnet uh, magnets have the invisible field lines and because of that uh, there is attraction at a distance right uh, other example of the non contact force is electrostatic force okay for example the negative charge and the positive charge they are attracted towards each other at a distance and they do not need to be in a contact with each other to apply a force on each other okay so uh, the gravitational force magnetic force electrostatic force and nuclear force are the examples of the non contact forces right so uh, before we go uh, before we talk more about the forces we we need to know we need to understand these terms scalar and vector speed and velocity and acceleration let's first talk about the scalar and vector quantities okay so uh, scalar quantities are those quantities which only tell which only tells the magnitude of something and on the other hand the vector quantities tells the magnitude with the direction okay so uh, don't worry if you do not understand from this definition speed and velocity are the example of scalar and vector quantities speed is a scalar quantity and velocity is vector quantity right so what happens is that uh, if i am moving from point a to point b right i am moving with the speed of 5 kilometers per hour okay and so uh, when i am moving uh, from point a to point b i am saying that i am moving with a with a speed of 5 kilometers per hour and if i go back to point a from point b i would again say i am moving with a speed of 5 kilometers per hour and i do not need to mention in which direction i am going but if you are saying that you are going with the velocity of 5 kilometers per hour from point a to point b and if you again in case 2 are coming to point a from point b then you need to mention that you are coming in the opposite direction and your uh, velocity will be negative 5 kilometers per hour right in both the cases the speed is same but velocity is different in first case velocity was 5 kilometers per hour 
and in second case the velocity become minus 5 kilometers per hour okay so you see the difference the speed only tells the magnitude of a quantity but the velocity uh, also tells the direction with the magnitude okay so that's the difference between speed and velocity velocity is speed with the direction okay so now that we have learned about the velocity we should uh, let's go to the acceleration so what is acceleration so acceleration is nothing but the change in velocity with respect to time for example change in the position with respect to time is the velocity similarly the acceleration is the change in velocity with respect to time suppose these are the two balls which uh, which need to move to the point b okay and ball a arrives at the point b in 2 seconds okay and a uh, ball b arrives at point b in 4 seconds so in both the cases the acceleration of the ball is different in first case the acceleration is higher as compared to the ball b okay so uh, the acceleration is nothing but the change in velocity with respect to time okay so now let's uh, put the ball a and ball b and start the motion at the same time okay so let's see what happens the ball a arrives quickly but ball b takes a little bit more time as compared to ball a okay and it is happening because in ball a the velocity is changing very fast and the velocity is changing very fast that means it has the higher acceleration as compared to ball b right so uh, that was about the acceleration okay so now that you have understood the acceleration the velocity now we can talk about the newton's laws of motions okay before that i would like to show you an example these are the four penguins which are sitting on the car and as you can see uh, all the all those penguins they reach at the at the final destination at different time right so in which case the penguin has the highest acceleration the first one or the last one you all can answer me in the comment section in which case the penguin has the higher amount of acceleration the last one which is arriving at a lesser amount of time will have the higher acceleration as compared to all other penguins right so now let's talk about the newton's three laws of motion so newton uh, uh came up with these three laws of motion first law of motion second law of motion and third law of motion so first let's uh, discuss about the first law of motion okay and this law is also known as the law of inertia okay so uh, the inertia suppose uh, if you want to move a couch at your house right if you want to move a couch at your house you need to apply a huge amount of force if you want to move that couch right but if i say you uh, you need to move a chair you can uh, move it easily okay let's take another example of that suppose i have a football on the ground and i have a stone of the same size like the football on the ground and if you were asked to kick one of them which one will you kick the football or the stone you are obviously going to kick the football because uh, it will be easier to kick a football and uh, give it a, mo a motion right but what will happen if you kick the stone you will break your leg okay and the stone will not move right so the inertia is nothing uh, inertia has to do with the mass the more will be the mass more will be the inertia okay so if you want to uh, move something which is really heavy you need to apply more force to it okay and that heavy thing has more inertia as compared to any other thing which are which are less heavier than that thing okay so the inertia at rest is the inertia when uh, something is at rest and it do not want to it does not want to move okay and inertia at motion is when something some object is moving in a certain direction 
for example this ball is moving on the ground and it has a it has a certain direction of the movement okay so uh, this ball is will not move until and unless some force is applied on it so what are the forces on the earth that will resist the ball that will resist the movement of the ball the first one is the roughness of the surface the roughness of the surface will try to stop the motion of the ball and air drag also that will also try to stop the ball but suppose if i take that ball to the space okay and i throw it the ball will keep on moving with a speed right because it has nothing on the space which can make it stop for example there is no ground so there will not be any uh, roughness uh, that will try to stop the ball there is no atmos atmosphere so there will not be uh, any kind of air drag to stop it right so the ball in this space will keep on moving in the same direction right so this is inertia at motion if the ball is moving it will keep on moving until and unless some kind of force is applied on it okay so uh, this law of inertia tells that an object is which is at rest stays at rest and an object which is in motion is will stay in the motion with the same speed and with the same direction unless acted upon by an unbalanced force so this is the newton's first law of inertia okay and here is an activity that you can do at home and for this activity you'll require a scale and to uh carom coins okay so let's see what i did in this one first i'm making a tower of this coin like this okay now one by one i am removing the coins from the bottom and as you can see that the tower is still there it is the tower is not moving right the tower is still there and it's not moving and why it is happening it is happening because the law of inertia because i am only applying the force on the bottom coin right there okay so i am only applying the force on the coin which is at the bottom so all the other coins which are on that uh, which are uh, towered on that coins will not move because uh, there is there isn't any force which are applied on them right so only the coin which is at the bottom will get out of the tower right so let's see let's watch this one again and you can also try this one as at home and this is called the tower of inertia okay one by one you can remove the coin from the bottom you can swipe out them like uh, like using the scale like that okay and this is called the tower of inertia and it explains the law of inertia which is the newton's first law of motion okay so uh, the object will stay at rest if it, if it is at rest until and unless some force is applied on it and if, if an object is moving with a speed in some direction the object will keep on moving in that certain direction and with the same speed until and unless some kind of force is applied on it right so that was the example of newton's law of inertia that you can also try okay so uh, in this case what is happening uh this person who is skating and when he uh, when he loses his balance he he couldn't suddenly stop and he go very far and then hit the ground and by hitting the ground the ground makes him stop so when he was skating he gained some kind of inertia okay and with that inertia uh, it was impossible to stop suddenly to stop the motion suddenly and that's why he hit the ground and ground stops him right so that was about the newton's first law 
and now and now let's go to the newton second law and this second law of the newton is about the relationship between force and acceleration and mass okay so let's get started suppose you have a cart and the cart is empty and you can drag it very easily right uh, you will not require any kind of extra force to move that am i right but suppose someone sat on the uh, the cart and now if you try to move it you will apply you will you will need to apply more amount of force in order to move that certain cart why because it has more mass as compared to this previous case am i right so from from this example you can say that more that the force is directly proportional to mass more will be the mass more you will need to apply the force right and acceleration is directly proportional to force right so more there will be force more there will be acceleration so uh, this is what newton's uh, second law of motion says it says that the acceleration is directly proportional to the force right so uh, suppose there is a block on the ground and i started applying a force on that block like that okay the block will start moving in the same direction of the force with the acceleration of a right so what happens what this newton second law says it says that the acceleration is directly proportional to the force and it is inversely proportional to the mass of the block right so uh so what happens that the acceleration of an object as produced by the net force is directly proportional to the magnitude of the force in the same direction as the force and inversely proportional to the mass of the object so this is the equation of the newton's second law of motion f is equal to ma f is directly proportional to mass and f is also proportional to acceleration so it's the equation of the newton's second law f is equal to ma right so uh, so now you have understood that if you want to move an object which has a great mass which have a, a which is very heavy then you need to apply more amount of force if you want to move that particular thing with the great mass right so that was the second law of motion now let's come to the third law of motion that is action and reaction okay so uh, you must have seen the swimmers how they swim what they try to do there is that they try to push the pump push uh, push the water in the backward direction and that water it pushes the person in the forward direction and that's the way you swim in the swimming pool right you push the water backward and water pushes you forward right so this is what you are doing here you are applying a action force on the water and water is reacting to that and applying the same amount of force but in the opposite direction on you right so the same thing happens if i am standing on the ground i am applying some kind of force on the ground okay but the ground is also applying the same amount of force on me but in the opposite direction right so these are called the forces of action and reaction right so uh for example the launch of a rocket right the rocket will apply some amount of force on the ground and as a result the ground will also apply a reaction force on the rocket which will make the rocket launch so uh, this is the newton's third law of motion every action has an equal and opposite reaction right so this is what the newton's third law says if an object a exerts a force on object b then object b must exert a force of equal magnitude and opposite direction back on the object a right so that was the third law of newton so in this case when she is throwing a ball on that person the ball bounces back to her 
Now you have understood that it is the example of Newton's third law of motion. When the ball uh, hit the person, the person also applied the same force on the ball. And that's the reason why that ball bounced back to her. And she got hit, right? So that was the example of Newton's third law of motion. And this one is also an example of Newton's third law of motion, right? See what happens when the person was moving the barrier cam and it applied the force on the person because person applied some kind of force on the barrier. Okay, and the barrier also applied some kind of force on the person, right? So, so those were the three laws of motion that was, uh, those were given by Newton, right? Now let's talk about the another law, which is the law of momentum conservation, right? So uh, before uh, I go ahead with this momentum conservation, you should uh, know about what is momentum and what is conservation. So first let's talk about the momentum. Suppose there is a ball and this ball has a mass of M. Right, and it is moving with a certain velocity in a certain direction, right? So its momentum will be m multiplied by v. So momentum is the product of mass and velocity. And as I have told you before, that the velocity is a vector quantity. Am I right? The velocity is a vector quantity. So uh, momentum is what? Is it scalar or is it vector? What do you think the momentum is? Is it a vector quantity or is it a scalar quantity? Okay. So uh, as the velocity is a vector quantity, the momentum is also a vector quantity. Okay. So whenever you tell a momentum to a person, you need to tell the direction of that momentum also. Right, so momentum has a direction, okay? And this ball, which is moving with a velocity V in a certain direction will have the momentum of V, which is equal to MV, right? So uh, suppose in this case, uh, when I'm hitting a white ball, the white ball hits the black ball, right? And the black ball starts moving, right? So what exactly is happening here? When I hit the white ball with the black ball, the black ball starts moving, right? So the black ball gains some momentum because of the white ball, right? So uh, what happens is that uh, this is the transfer of momentum. When you collide with something or when a ball collide with another ball, it transfers its momentum to the other ball. Right, and this is called the momentum transfer. Right, so uh, now you know the transfer of momentum and what momentum is, then let's talk about the conservation of momentum. And for that, I'll show you a video, I'll show you a video here, and you need to observe what exactly is happening right there. Okay. So I'm going to play this, and you need to observe what exactly is happening there. Okay. So there are four identical balls right there of the same mass. And when I hit all those four balls with one ball, the one ball came out of the path. Now I'm, uh, I'm hitting those two balls with two balls again. And as you can see that the two ball came in the hand. They came out of the path. I'll play this one again and observe what is happening. When two balls are hitting, the two, only two balls are coming out of the path, right? So what do you think will happen if I hit three balls? How many balls will come in my hand? One, two, three, or all the four balls. How many balls do you think will come in my hand? You can answer me on the comment section if you want, okay? And I'm constantly looking at the comment section and I will really appreciate it if you answer me on that section, okay? 
So uh, let's play this once again. And let's see how many ball will come in the hand if I hit this one ball with three balls, right? Three balls came in my hand. See? So uh, this is the conservation of momentum, right? So what he said, he said that the momentum of a system is, a, is constant, okay? Until and unless some kind of external force is applied on the system, right? So let's uh, see this with a more... Uh, with a simple example, okay? I have two balls, right? And first ball has the mass of M and the second ball has the mass of M1. And the first ball is moving with the velocity V, okay, to the, in the direction of M1, right? So after some time, the ball M is going to hit the ball M1, right? So in this case, suppose, this is the system, right? And there is no external force which is applying on the system, okay? So when this ball hits the M1, that will be the uh, picture of after the collision. But first, let's talk about what happens, uh, what is happening before the collision. So uh, uh, at this time, before the collision, what is the momentum of system? The momentum is MV which is the momentum of the first ball. And because the second ball is not moving, it has the velocity of zero, it has the momentum of zero, right? So the momentum of the whole system is MV before the collision, right? So what do you think will happen after the collision? The ball M1 will start moving with the velocity V1 in the same direction. Okay, now consider it again as the system because there is no external forces applying on them, right? So the first ball stops and the second ball starts moving with the velocity V1. And because there is a conservation of momentum that says that the momentum will remain constant of a system, right? So in this case, after the collision, the momentum is M1 multiplied by V1. So suppose in this case, the momentum is P1, and in the previous case, the momentum was P, which was equal to MP, okay? So this is the picture of after the collision, and let's apply the law of momentum conservation to it. So in this case, the momentum of system will remain constant. So P is equal to P1. So the product of MV the mass of the first ball and the velocity of the first ball will be equal to the product of M1 and P1, okay? So this is what the law of momentum conservation says. It says that the momentum of a system will remain same until and unless some kind of uh, external force is applied on them, right? So uh, that was the law of momentum conservation. And uh, I'll show you a video, an activity that you can also do at home and you can also try, right? But before that, I would like to ask you a question right there. There's a car which is coming in the direction of the bicycle and the bicycle is also coming towards the car. So when they will collide with each other, what will happen? The person who is sitting inside the car will get hurt or the person who is sitting on that bicycle or riding that bicycle will get hurt more. What do you think will happen? Obviously, the person who is riding the bicycle will get hit by the car and will have more velocity after the collision, right? And why is that? This is because the product of momentum, which is uh, the product of mass and velocity, which is momentum, will remain constant. And because the, the person who is on the bicycle, uh, they have the less amount of mass as compared to the mass of the car. So if you, uh, if you multiply the lower amount of mass with some velocity, and then, then the velocity will be higher. So the product of 
mass and velocity velocity should be constant am i right so in this case when the mass is lower the velocity will be higher and if the mass is high then the velocity will be lower so after the collision there will not be any effect on the car but the person who is sitting on that bicycle will get hurt right so in this activity you can try using two balls one ball which is the bigger one has the uh, higher amount of mass right and the ball which is the small one has lower amount of mass okay which is less heavier as compared to the bigger ball and when i uh, place them like this the the lighter ball above on the big ball and if i uh, if i leave them on the ground what will happen when they hit the ground let's see the smaller ball gained a lot amount of velocity after the after hitting the ground and the bigger ball remained at the same place right and it didn't have much velocity as compared to the smaller one okay so let's play this one again and observe what is happening you can also try this one at home okay so what is happening there is that when the when those two ball hit the ground the momentum from the bigger ball was transferred to the the smaller ball and because that the smaller ball has lesser amount of the mass it will have higher amount of velocity and that's the reason why it will bounce more than the bigger ball right so that thing that you can also try at home right so in this case what do you think is happening right there the person who wanted to kick the football but somehow he missed to kick he missed the football right so he was supposed to transfer his momentum to the ball but he couldn't so the momentum he still have the momentum after the kicking the ball because there was no ball and he uh, and because of that momentum he swing like that right so uh, that was about the momentum conservation which was the last part of our session and if you have any questions regarding this session and regard if you have any doubt if you have any queries then my team is right there to help you out okay and you can ask the questions in the comment section okay so let's see if i have any doubts okay some of the questions i can answer you and we have this uh 10 to 15 minutes of time to answer your queries okay so uh in this sec in this session we have learned about the forces we have learned about the momentum what is momentum and how the momentum is conserved we have we have learned about the speed and velocity what's the difference between speed and velocity and what is the acceleration you uh, do you know that the value of the gravity which is uh, 9.8 which is also an acceleration its unit is meter per second square right so this gravity is an acceleration that uh, the ground applies on it so whenever you throw a ball into the sky the ball will come back to the ground with the acceleration of 9.81 meter per second square right so uh, the gravity is also a kind of acceleration okay then we learned about the newton's first law of motion newton's second law of motion and newton's third law of motion right so we have talked about the inertia and all of these kind of things so if you have any doubt or if you have any queries you can just answer you can just uh, shoot in the comment section and my team is right there to help you out it was great session with you all and i will be really happy if you ask any questions right and
Okay, so there was a doubt. If I throw a feather and a ball, there will be different acceleration in both. Right. That's right. Because of the air drag. If you throw a feather and if you throw a ball, the feather will come to the ground in a, you know, with a less acceleration or the acceleration will be same on both the objects. But because of the air drag, which is applying a force in the opposite direction, the feather will take more amount of time to come to the crown, right? The gravity which is applying on both the object is same. But because of the air drag and because feather has lower mass, the air drag applies on it. Air drag is also applying on the football also. But because it has more mass, there will be the negligible, uh, there will be negligible changes in the motion of ball. But because the feather has lesser amount of, uh, you know, mass, the air drag will, which is applied on it will have more effect on the feather, right? So this is why both will come with a different speed on the ground. So if you have any other doubt, I'm right here and my team is also right there to, uh, to help you, okay? So, We'll be starting the next session in about uh, 10 minutes. And the name of the session is Into the Magnetism, OK? So I'm here for uh, 10 to 15 minutes. And you can ask in the comment section if you have any doubt, OK? OK, if two objects with a different mass are thrown from the same height, suppose uh, there is an elephant and there is a mouse which are thrown from the same building the so boats will arrive at the ground with the same you know with the at the same time right so there is one more thing that i want to show you if you are still able to see my screen okay that's a little 3d uh, simulation i did in the blender okay and i have a two two balls right there and one is a straight path and one is a curved path so which ball, uh, if I uh, if I drop all, both, the, both the balls at the same time, which ball will arrive at, at the final point in lesser amount of time? The one which is moving, which will move in the curved path or the one which is which will move in the straight path? Which ball will uh, arrive at the final point in lesser amount of time? So I'll play the animation, okay? And let's see which ball will arrive at the first, arrive first. See what happened. The ball which was on the curved path arrived to the final point in lesser amount of time, right? But the, and that ball need to travel a longer path to come to the final point, but still it came to first, right? So what could be the reason behind that? Okay, so that's the question for you. It's a question, I'll just play the simulation again and you can tell the answer in the comment section. The ball which is uh, coming from the curved path, arriving first, right? Again, let me play this once again. Okay, so you can answer me in the comment section, okay? And if you have any doubt, you can just ask. Right? And to do more uh, these kind of uh, activities, okay, just like I performed right there, okay, you can uh, visit our Let's Tinker app, okay, and Utkarsh will share the link on the YouTube comment section. 
and you can download it and there are so many activities of science and you can uh, see those activities right there and all of them they are very interesting and if you are a science enthusiast and you want to learn and you want to do more these kind of activities at home you can go and visit that app okay so i'm constantly looking at your doubts and uh, i'll answer you if you have any other uh doubt that needs to be uh so someone answered me in the comment section that this is because both are starting with p but initially due to the curved path it will gain more velocity and reach the point first and uh, it was vinayak parma so uh, that was great answer vinayak and you were right that uh, when i uh, when i left uh, when i dropped all uh, four two balls the ball which is on the curved path will have the a more initial velocity as compared to the other one and because of that it ha it, it has gained a uh, more inertia in it right so when the curve is flattened it already has the inertia and it is already has the higher uh, velocity right and that's the reason why why it is arriving first okay so man i see many of your answers and uh most of them are co are correct and some of you have guessed it guessed it that it the ball which is on the curved path will will come first okay so ma'am does gravity increase with 9.8 meter so the gravity is 9.8 meter per second square okay so it's 53 acha uh, i have another question for you so uh, mass and weight do you know what's the difference between mass and weight so whenever you measure you uh, whenever you are standing on a balancing machine uh, suppose i am standing on the balancing machine and it shows 56 kg so is that 56 kg uh, kg is my mass or is it my weight what do you think is it i am standing on a weighing machine and i measure uh, and it measures 56 kg so what is that is it my mass or is it my weight so you can answer me in the comment section and mass weight gayatri said that it's weight uh sundri uh, pillar said that it's weight and vinayak said it weight no uh it's not weight it's mass so it's great to see your answers though it is my mass it's not my weight okay weight is the force and you will have the weight if you multiply your mass with the gravity so as i have told you that the force is equal to mass multiplied by acceleration and the weight is mass multiplied by acceleration of gravity which is g so the mg will be my weight but the 56 km uh, kilogram which is i'm measuring is my mass it's not my weight and most of the people like many people think that it's weight but it's not weight it's mass weight is the force that i'm applying to the ground right and mass is weight divided by the acceleration of the ground right so any other doubts you have then we'll be uh, starting our next session in 5 minutes which is also a great session if you want to join that one also it's all our yeah uh 
Devashi said that the kg is the unit of mass. So I asked you that 56 kilogram is my weight of mass. So 56 kilogram is my mass, obviously. But the weighing machine, it measures weight, but it shows the mass, right? So, uh, Any other doubts? I see there are a lot of comments. It's great to see your enthusiasm. It was great. So we'll be starting this session in two minutes, right? So uh, I'm constantly looking at your comments, right? If you have any doubt, we can discuss it. And then uh, we'll be starting the new topic, which is into the magnetism, right? So this is going to be really great. And Okay, so uh, we all uh, have played with magnets when we were like children, right? So uh, we love doing stuff with the magnets. We, uh, we play like there are toys to us or something. So you must know that there are some properties of magnets, like the repulsion of the same pole is the property of magnet. The attraction between two uh, magnets is a property of magnet, right? And these properties are called the magnetism. So this session is into the magnetism, okay? And we are going to talk about the magnet, mag magnets and all those kind of things which magnets can do and what is the importance of magnets in our day-to-day -day life, right? So uh, I think we should get started with this, uh, with this session. So uh, what are the magnets that you see in your daily life? For example, the earphones that I am wearing right now, they also have some magnets in, inside them, right? So if you open it, I'm not going to open my earphones because uh, my parents will not buy me a new earphone. So you can try opening yours and see that there is a, a small magnet inside this. And what these small magnets do inside the earphones, 
the same magnets are also found in the microphones in the loudspeakers so um, is there any guess what these magnets do inside those uh, earphones loudspeakers and you know microphones what is the purpose of these magnets inside these uh, earphones or magnets okay so i don't see any uh, answers uh so okay so what these magnets do inside those earphones and microphones so what happens when a electrical signal is generated these magnets they convert that electrical signal into the uh sound signal okay and that's how we uh, we listen to the music with uh, with the help of the uh, earphones right so <laughs> the opposite thing happen in the in case of microphone in case of microphones the those magnets they convert the sound signal to the electrical signal right so i will learn more about how these magnets work okay but before that do you know that the earth also has a magnetic field right but what is the importance of the magnetic field of the earth you can answer me in the comment section and i'm constantly looking at the comment section right so i can read all your answers what is the importance of earth's magnetic field that's my question most of you are thinking that uh uh with the help of compass we can uh, see the direction in which direction i'm moving in which direction i'm going okay but it's the era of google maps right we don't need compasses anymore so what is the other uh, important role that this magnetic field play any guesses any random guesses will work i'm just looking at the comments and i'll be happy to see your answers right there okay so <clears throat> what is so important role that this this magnetic field plays okay i'll i'll, uh, I'll show you a video and you will understand right sorry for this bad animation i was trying something else and yeah so the image that you are seeing on your screen do you think that it's real or it's fake what do you think is it real or is it fake so i see some answers yes uh there are many answers and many of you are thinking that it's real and why would i show a fake image on the session right so many of you are thinking that it's real okay so um, it's obviously the real phenomena but it doesn't look like real it looks like uh, it is edited or something so this phenomena is called aurora borealis okay which uh, occurs in our uh, top most uh, atmosphere in our uh, northern hemisphere of the earth and also occurs in the southern hem hemisphere of the earth which is called aurora australis okay so these kind of phenomena only occurs at the top atmosphere of our earth and the reason behind that is the ma uh, the magnetic field of the earth right so how does this happen i'll show you with the help of the video okay so we know that the sun which is a great source of energy it releases the solar storms very frequently and those solar storms they approaches our earth at very high amount of velocity okay and now you'll see what this magnetic field of earth does with the solar winds so these are the solar winds which are approaching the earth and this is how the magnetic field uh it prevents that solar storms to enter in our atmosphere right so it is very much helpful in preventing those uh, solar storms to enter in our atmosphere and those solar storms are very harmful and they can 
strip away our atmosphere of the earth and you know that the without atmosphere it is impossible to survive right how we will breathe without the atmosphere it's not possible right so this is what the atmosphere uh, does with the solar storms it prevents it to enter in our atmosphere of the earth so uh, so uh, when the solar storms collide with the earth's magnetic field the magnetic field rearranges like the rubber band like this but somehow those charged particles they enter in our atmosphere uh, from the top atmosphere and from the bottom right so somehow they manage to enter in our atmosphere and mainly uh, those atmosphere uh, are in the northern island or in the southern hemisphere of the earth and on those at those places we can uh, see these kind of phenomena with our eyes right so uh, and these are also called polar lights right and the no northern lights the southern lights right so uh, this is what happens and uh, if that atmos if the magnetic field wasn't there then it would be uh, uh, the the solar winds can easily uh, get into the atmosphere and they will they will strip away the atmosphere and without the atmosphere no life is possible so this magnetic uh, field plays this great role in our daily life the magnetic field of the earth right so after that that was about the magnetic field of the earth so what is the import uh, what's the importance of the magnetism in our daily life okay so can anybody answer in what uh, how can i uh, what what are the day to day uh, things uh, in which i use the magnetism you can answer me in the comment section yes uh, it, uh, it can be seen from uh, finland norway and it can also be seen from the siberia also and yes so uh, if you go to alaska it will be also visible from alaska the aurora borealis and talking about the aurora borealis borealis i just so the comments a few okay so uh, what is the importance of the magnetism in our daily life right so the most important role is that is it generates the electrical energy right and we'll talk about the electrical energy a little bit later on this session okay so before that i want to show you something very interesting uh do you know that uh, this train is the world's fastest train do you know the name of this train you can just answer me in the comment section what is the name of this train and i see some of your answers uh the the important role of magnetism uh, some said that it is used in mixer it is used in fan it is used in a speaker trace door okay okay magnetic levitation great so uh, let's come back to our this train okay this is the world's fastest train right and do you know that it works on the magnetic levitation most of you do not know the meaning of levitation but don't worry i'll show you something and you'll understand what levitation is exactly okay so this the name of this train is maglev train of shanghai which is in china right and its speed is 450 km per hour and which makes it the world's fastest train and this maglev train yes yeah, some of you have answered it the maglev train okay great great to see your enthusiasm excellent guys okay so uh, this maglev is uh, is the combination of two terms magnet and levitation okay so some of you who don't know what this levitation is i'll show you uh, activity of a teaching aid okay and you'll understand what levitation is exactly 
okay so levitation is nothing but the suspension in uh, air okay so this cylindrical thing that you are seeing is the levitron see when i when we placed it on that platform it got suspended in the air like that so this is called the levitation and this was the example of levitation so these maglev train they uh, they run on the same principle of the levitation of magnets right so they are suspended about uh, they are suspended about the ground like this and the magnet the magnetic field the magnetic force balances the gravitational force and it do not uh, it do not come in the contact with the ground and this is how it levitates about the ground and uh, and that's the reason why it is the world's fastest train because it do not have any contact between the ground and itself and if there is no contact there will not be any resistance and there will not be any friction of the ground and if and when there is no friction the speed will be higher and that's why it is the world's fastest train so this is how it works this is how it levitates above the ground and this is why it is called maglev train okay so uh, that was really interesting one okay so now let's talk about how this uh, industrial revolution happened with the help of the magnetism so magnetism have uh, has a great role uh, in the field of this industrial revolution okay so we are going to talk about a little bit of history how it started in 1800 okay so first we'll be talking about the electromagnets and second we'll be talking about the faraday's law and how faraday uh, is known as the father of electromagnetic induction what did he do right and then we'll talk about the electric electric generator how we can produce the electricity using the small generators right and then at last uh, these the these electric generators are the reason behind the industrial revolution that happened in late 1800 right so let's get started so this revolution is started with this small experiment that was done by oristed okay so i'll i'll show you a video and i'll see your answers what did you observe from this particular teaching aid okay so i'm going to play it and just observe what is happening right there so this is a magnetic needle and if you have any doubt you can just ask me my support team is there to help you okay just observe what exactly is happening there in that activity i have connected the wires to supply a current to this wire see what is happening the needle got deflected so what did you understand from this activity when uh, when we uh, passed a current to the wire the needle got deflected and the magnetic needle only deflects whenever there is some kind of magnetic field right so when uh, there was a magnetic field uh, that the current was passing through the wire the needle got deflected so what it tells us it tells us that uh, when the current was passing through that conductor uh, it was also uh, producing some kind of magnetic field and that's the reason why that needle got deflected so that was the experiment that was done by oristed and from this experiment a uh, revolution started in this field right so uh, any current carrying conductor becomes um produces magnetic field right whenever a current passes through it right 
so and you can tell the direction of the magnetic field with the Ma uh, maxwell's right hand thumb rule so if the current is flowing the in the upper direction the magnetic field field will be in the clockwise direction like this okay so uh, that was the experiment which was done by the oristat okay so now many researchers come all the scientists come they saw this experiment and uh, the field the magnetic field that the uh, conductor was producing was very less right so they wanted to increase that magnetic field so what did they do to increase the magnetic field they uh, came up with this thing these are called the solenoids and these are nothing but the copper coils okay so if you coil copper wire many times it will become a solenoid okay so when you pass a current through this solenoid it uh, it produces large amount of magnetic fields right so like this when a current passes through the solenoid it produces more amount of magnetic field lines it tells us that the field line which are producing the magnetic force which is producing is higher as compared to a single wire right right so uh, now here comes the concept of electromagnetism so you must you all must have heard about electromagnets right so how does this electromagnet work i'll tell you with the help of this teaching aid okay so this is a electromagnet and these are the solenoids or copper coils and these are the battery terminals and i can connect the wire on uh, on those terminals right and there is a soft iron rod and this is the battery uh, eliminator right there okay so let's make the connections and let's see what happens when I, when the current passes through it right now the switch is off right the switch is off and now i uh, now i'm connecting those wires to those terminals of the electromagnet so it is not attracting the iron rod okay because the switch is off so now let's turn on the switch and increase our voltage in a just a little bit and see what happens the iron rod is started attracting to the electromagnet am i right so when that uh, iron rod is started attracting to the electromagnet we can say that the magnetic field was produced in that electromagnet right so uh, these are called the electromagnets so what is the difference between the permanent magnet and the electromagnets why do we use electromagnets more than the permanent magnets so you can just answer me in the comment section and i want to see your answers what do you think is the difference between permanent magnets and electromagnets and why do we uh, prefer electromagnets over the permanent magnets when we need to uh, pick up something or using those magnets so uh, yes a uh, great battery electromagnets are temporary right and uh, whenever i want something uh, whenever i want to switch on this electromagnet i just need to switch on like uh, okay but to to the permanent magnets are always magnetic they will always produce a magnetic field and i don't have any switch to turn it off or turn it on but that thing i have with the electromagnets if i want to turn them turn them the turn them on i just need to switch it on right and it will become magnetic what is the what is the another difference between electromagnets and permanent magnet i can also control the strength of the magnet in the electromagnet and normally the electromagnet are stronger than the permanent magnet 
and that is why uh, when we need a higher amount of uh, magnetic fo uh, force we always use the electromagnets because the magnetic force in the permanent magnet as compared to the electromagnets is lesser right so uh, when the so uh, when i uh, conducted conducted that solenoid the it produces a magnetic field or you can say that it become magnetic right so what will happen if i bring a permanent magnet near to that solenoid what do you think will happen if i keep that solenoid under uh, under the presence of a magnetic field line or if i bring it near to the permanent magnet same thing that happens when i uh, when i bring same poles of the magnet near to each other they will start uh, applying some uh, repulsion force on each other so the same thing will happen here so when you uh, bring a magnet near to the solenoid that solenoid will uh, experience some kind of force okay and the direction of that force can be given with the help of this uh, left hand rule so it is a left hand rule of flemings right so what happens in this case you need to take your left hand okay some people by mistake they take their right hand and all the direction goes wrong right so uh, so you need to take your uh, left hand and this uh, this second finger it shows the direction of the current this fourth finger will show the direction of the magnetic field and this thumb will uh, tell the direction of the force so whenever you um, you keep a solenoid in the presence of the magnetic field okay and if you want to know the direction of the force in which direction the solenoid will feel its force you need to apply your left hand rule on it okay so in this case the direction of the magnetic field is from north pole to south pole right and the direction of the current is in the solenoid is in, in is in this direction of my uh, second finger and the and so from this second say that it will experience a force in the direction of my thumb right so the solenoid will start uh, experiencing a force in the upward direction right so let's uh, see a video here and let's see how it works how the force is applied on a solenoid right we can uh, find out the direction with the help of this left hand tool okay now i am up, i'm conducting the wire and as you have seen that when i connected that wire to it okay so when uh, the wire is in the middle right now okay so when i connected the wire to it it will experience a force in the backward direction just observe it see it went backward and the same thing uh, will happen it will again experience some kind of force what i did here i switched the terminals of the wires okay and now in this case the wire should feel a force in the opposite direction so in the previous one it went uh, in the backward direction so in this case it should come in the forward direction so let's see what happens i'm going to play this video again see it came in the forward direction i'll just play this once again and observe are you able to see the wire the wire is coming in the forward direction and why is that because it is experiencing a force in the forward direction right so uh, so faraday he saw this activity right he saw that the when the wire is kept under the uh, magnetic field and if we applied a uh, a uh, current to it then the wire experienced some kind of force right so he he thought that what will happen if i do the vice versa for example if i apply a force on the wire 
and i put it in the magnetic field will it induce some kind of current in the wire so now uh, faraday's law come into the picture and that was the great breakthrough for this industrial revolution so let's talk about this faraday's law so here is a prototype of that so the brown one that you are seeing on your screen is a copper coin right and this uh, the red one here is a magnet so let's see what will happen if i insert that magnet inside that copper coin and it's this device is called the galvanometer and this galvanometer shows the deflection shows uh, the direction of the current and the magnitude of the current so if the current is produced then it will deflect right so let's see what happens when i insert that coil in uh, insert that magnet inside that copper coil see the needle is deflecting are you able to see this the needle of the galvanometer is started deflecting when i inserted that um, magnet inside that copper coil are you able to see that okay so what happens this is the faraday's law of uh, current induction so whenever there is a relative motion between the magnet and the copper coil a current will uh, induced in the copper coil okay and as i have said earlier that is first it was a great breakthrough for this industrial revolution that was about to happen in that era of time right so after this experiment uh so faraday came up with this with the idea of the electrical generator and the image that you are seeing in on your screen it is the first generator first electrical generator of the history and that is also known as the faraday's disk generator okay so i'll tell you how this generator works with the help of the prototype of this generator and how this generator generates the electricity and the concept behind that is obviously the faraday's law right so let's see what happens this is a prototype of that of faraday's disk generator right so i have a magnet right there which is a permanent magnet okay and i'm going to place it right there so when i place it place that magnet on that uh, on that curve uh, the curved one with is made up of iron so when i attach that magnet to the iron the iron becomes magnetized right so the whole system works as a magnet okay so i have a elastic band this is a led that we have just connected right and now i am connecting this elastic band to it okay and this is how i can rotate the disk and when i am rotating the disk the coil that was inside the that was in that was right there in the middle of that magnet okay it also it starts moving it is it also starts rotating like that okay so when i am rotating the coil are also rotating okay and what do you think is happening to the led see when i'm rotating the disk the led starts blinking and why it starts blinking because that relative motion between the magnet and the coil produces some kind of current right and because of that uh, current induction the led starts blinking because there is some kind of electricity okay so let's see what happens if i change the direction of the magnet 
or if I uh, start rotating in the opposite direction. So when I change the polarity, the LED blinks when I'm rotating in the opposite direction. But in this direction, the LED do not blink, right? So the direction of the current depends upon the direction of the magnetic field and the force that I'm applying on the coil, right? So that was the great prototype of the, you know, that the disk generator of the Faraday and that is how it worked and that is how it generated the electricity, right? And that was a great breakthrough for this industrial revolution. And now he, th he thought that uh, it is not really possible uh, to generate the electricity for, um, for the people which are in the city. So you have to make, you know, bigger disk and produce more amount in, in order to produce more amount of electricity. So that's the reason why we have the windmills and also the water turbines, right? So these big turbines, they rotate and uh, they generate the electricity, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> so now that you have understand the working model of that uh, Faraday's disk generator, let's talk a little bit more about that, okay? So in this case, suppose this is the animation of that uh, generator right there okay the coil is rotating in in the presence of the magnetic field right so the coil so when i'm rotating a coil right so uh because of that rotation because of that relative motion between the magnetic field and the copper coil some kind of uh, current produces in the copper coil right and that is why we see the deflection in the galvanometer, right? Because there are some, some kind of current is flowing through the circuit, okay? And you can also tell the direction of the current with the help of Fleming's right-hand rule, right? In, in generators, we apply the Fleming's right-hand right hand rule, but in case of electric motors, we apply the Fleming's left-hand rule, okay? So uh, this is the working model of that uh, electric generator that we have just seen, okay? And that was the starting of that uh, industrial revolution, right? And this is how, and at this time, we, uh, we produce the electricity with the help of windmills, with the help of these big turbines, right? And this is how the electricity is produced and supplied at our home, right? So uh, before that, I'll show you an activity but if you have any doubt related to this uh, this session, you can just ask in the comment section, and I'll uh, I'll tell you, and we'll solve the doubt right here. Okay, so I'll show you an activity that you can also try at home, which is an activity of making electric motors. Right. So let's see what happens. So the name of this activity is simplest motor ever. And for that, you'll require a round shape magnet. Let me say this once again. You'll, requ you'll require a round shape magnet and a copper coil that you can, uh, that are easily available anywhere, okay? You need a Duracell battery. You need two safety pins and you need a tape and a scissor to cut the tape, okay? This is all the things that you will require, right? So what I'm doing here, I'm uh, connecting those safety pins to that battery, to that Duracell battery like this. And now I'm uh, placing that copper coil in between those safety pins, okay? And now I have placed the magnet to it also. See, now see what happens. This copper coils, this copper coil starts rotating like this. Okay. Let me uh, play this once again. 
and see what is happening right there. So when I gave it a little push, it starts rotating. See, and this is the what? Uh, this is how the electrical motors work. They convert the electrical signals to the mechanical signal to the electrical energy to the mechanical energy, and this is how they rotate, right? So uh, that activity you can try at your home, and which is really interesting. Okay, and if you have any uh, doubt related to this particular uh, section, you can just ask in the comment section, and I'll answer you right there. Thanks a lot, and uh, yes. So I see uh, there are so many questions and my support team is also giving the answers. So if you have any doubt, you can just ask, you can shoot in the comment section. Great to see all of your enthusiasm and it was a great session. And after that, uh, Shraddha is here to tell you something Right. So I'll give a uh, wait. So if you have any doubt, you can just ask in the comment section and I'll just answer you right there. Okay. So someone has just asked me. It was Gayatri's question, how will you explain AC and DC? Okay, so the AC, uh, AC and DC, as you, as you can um, understand from the terms, AC means alternating current and DC means direct current, okay? So what happens in case of AC? Uh, wait, I'll just show you this one. So in this case, the current was flowing in different direction. So when the coil completed its half that it's its half rotation, the current will start uh, going in the different direction, right? So this is the AC AC current, okay? In one in half circle, the current is flowing suppose in the clockwise direction, and again in in another half rotation, the current is uh, flowing in opposite direction of that circuit. Right, so this is the alternating current. In alternating current, we have uh, two different direction of the current, which are um, in, uh, in the first one, the current is flowing, suppose in the clockwise direction, in second one, the current is flowing in the anti-clockwise direction. But in DC, uh, the current flows in the same direction, right? So this is how the AC and DC current box So if you have any doubts, you can just ask me in the comment section. And after two or three minutes, Shraddha will be there. And Shraddha has something to tell you. And yes. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. It was really a great session. So we are here till uh, 10 45 if you have any uh, questions you can just ask in the comment section okay and for many activities uh, you can just uh, go go visit our let's tinker app right
so my team and i'm here till uh, 11:45 and if you have any answers you can just ask in the comment section and himanshu and utkarsh will share the link with you of the let's thinker app where you can find a lot of these kind of activities that you can perform at home also and if you want to just see those activities with the help of like uh, teaching aids and all then you can just go and visit that app and there are so many uh, interesting activities right there okay can download it from the let stinker app also you just need to type it let stinker and utkarsh i think also has shared the link of the let stinker app right so if you have any doubts regarding this session you can just ask in the comment section okay So it was really great to have you guys here, and uh, once again, I would like to thank the Takshida group for giving us this great opportunity to present. Right. So uh, thank you all, and uh, I'm here for five more minutes. And if you have any doubts, you can just ask me. Okay. And also, uh, we are also. Uh, conducting a quiz which is uh, which is uh, the name of the quiz is lights camera action okay and in that quiz if you register and if you win that uh, we have some interesting prize money also and if you really love science and love uh, doing quizzes of the science you can participate in that quiz that we are conducting tomorrow the timing of that quiz will be from 10 am okay so you can participate in that quiz and that quiz is about to be the lights okay and the science behind the lights okay so it was really great to have you guys here and if you want to participate on that quiz you just go go to the let's tinker app and you can just participate in that quiz okay So I think Utkarsh has shared the link, and you can uh, just go to the Let's Tinker app, and you will see many activities right there. So it was really great to have you guys, and I see a lot, a lot of comments right there. And it was a great session, and uh, it was great to have you once again. Thank you, and. If you still have doubt, uh, I'm on the comment section. My team is on the comment section, and they are constantly uh, answering you. Okay, so thank you guys. It was great. <laughs>